A very warm welcome back, and I hope you're ready for our next session, which is an, indeed an exciting one. It's the role of a plant-based moment. Yes, and the moderator of this um, great session is Shweta Sooth, who is head of programs for 50 by 40. Shweta holds a postgraduate degree in English literature from the University of Delhi and has nearly a decade of experience in networking, campaign management, marketing, and content creation. Formerly working as the Deputy Programs Director at the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations, or FIAPO, she led diverse teams across a range of programs and communications and built many initiatives in advocacy and research and established social grassroots networks across 60 cities in India. Currently, she leads the programs department at 50 by 40, working across verticals of climate change, southern leadership, and partnership and strategy. Over to you, Shweta. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. And very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all present here today. Um, Thank you for joining us to discuss a very important aspect of the animal protection movement, which is the role of plant-based movements in Asia. So of late, the plant-based movement has gotten a lot of traction uh, from the big boom in cultivated and plant-based meats um, to perceiving food systems change as a silver bullet solution to some of the world's most pressing problems. Um, and as front runners of this movement, there are a few key pertinent points that are worthy of discussion. And that's what our speakers will be touching upon today. Uh, a small point to everyone who's viewing this uh, presentation right now in this session, uh, please do use the chat option in Zoom to raise any questions or points of discussions or ideas that come up uh, during, during these presentations. And I'd be happy to share those with our speakers um, for the Q&A. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, our first speaker for today is Dr. Yevonson, who works as a scientist and campaigner with World Animal Protection. He received his PhD in zoology from Beijing Normal University and is engaged in animal protection work for more than 18 years. Before he joined World Animal Protection in 2011, he worked with the International Fund for Animal Welfare and the Wildlife Conservation Society on various campaigns in China. Today, he will be speaking on the issue of wildlife and traditional medicine um, proposing herbal alternatives as a plant-based solution. So over to you, uh, Dr. Yevon. I work for World Animal Protection. Commercial exploration of wildlife is one of the most urgent threats to the both animal welfare and the survival of endangered species. Regarded as commodities, wild animals are widely used in food, tourism, exotic pets, luxury products, and traditional medicine, which form a global trade volume of 7 to 23 billion US dollars. The annual profit of Asian traditional medicine industry amounts to 6 billion US dollars. I believe many of you have heard about the cruelty of bears suffered in bear rat industry. Hundreds of thousands of bears live their entire lives in small, dirty cages unable to express normal behavior. They are often wounded, not only from bear bite extraction, but also from repeatedly hitting themselves against the bars in frustration being confined. The condition of big cats, such as lions and tigers, are also varying. They are usually confined to rows of tiny cages. Many show signs of starvation, with their ribs and backbones highly visible. The restrictive condition also causes them physical problems due to great stress. Penguins are also facing green challenges as well. Driven by the demand, more than 1 million penguins were poached in the wild globally between 2000 and 2013. The population of penguins in China has also fallen by 90% since 1970s. In traditional Chinese character, the medicine Yao as the picture illustrated, represents a person taking herbs to cure disease and eliminate pain. Traditional medicine is mainly composed of herbal and mineral materials, taking TCM as an example. There are around 12,000 Chinese medicine materials, 
in which about 11,000 are from plants, according to the latest data released by a national survey. Wildlife materials are not essential. They only account for a small part. It worth mentioning that there are no wildlife parts in the 60 cm drugs recommended by the Chinese government for the treatment of COVID-19, suggesting once more that its herbal medicines rather than wildlife medicine play a leading role in crises like the COVID pandemic. The use of captive wildlife in traditional medicine is not a tradition. In the past, wild animals in Tian are mostly captured from the wild, which is difficult. And that's why wildlife is not commonly used in TM. The culture of TCM also doesn't support the use of wild animals. As Sun Simiao, who is known as the king of Chinese medicine, point out, Fu Sha Sheng Qiu Sheng, Qiu Sheng Geng Yuan, meaning that in order to see one's life by killing animals, will make them further away from saving the life. Wild animals don't have mysterious effectiveness. Some consumers are obviously misled by false advertising by the industry. Wild animals should not be used in medicine. To protect wild animals in traditional medicine, World Animal Protection launched the campaign Wildlife Not Medicine to end the use of wildlife in traditional medicine. We believe herbal and human are solid Alternatives are the future of wildlife-friendly traditional medicine. Positive changes are happening. In 2016, a public survey commissioned by World Animal Protection indicates that more than 70% of Chinese public believe thereby farming is cruel and more than 80% of Chinese public want to ban the thereby industry. In another survey conducted by CTR, with the support of World Animal Protection in 2018, also showed that more than 90% of the public agree to protect big cats threatened by the traditional medicine, and more than 80% of public express their willingness to herbal substitutes. There's no doubt that the TM practitioners play a key role in terms of of their influence to patients and the public on wildlife medicines. A research jointly conducted by the WTA, AP, and the Trinity Doctors, a leading internet medical company, revealed that nearly 80% of doctors think wildlife animals in TM pose great threats to wild animals and it should be prohibited. And more than 30% of TM doctors think the ingredients of white animals have little effect, and more than 80% of TM doctors would like to choose herbal alternatives. Pharmaceutical and medical companies are also critical players with the support of World Animal Protection. Deloitte and the PwC conducted independent researches on the risks of business associated with the wildlife medicines and the impact of bending such business on relevant enterprises. The research concludes that enterprises that produce, sell, and invest in endangered wildlife drugs face multiple risks such as policy, market, public opinion, industrial environment, and finance. The research also point out that the demand for wildlife traditional medicine products will gradually decline due to the existence of more advantageous substitutes in the market. But modern science and technology will provide unprecedented opportunities for the development of herbal and synthetic substitutes. Clearly, the use of wildlife in traditional medicine has damaged the reputation of TM industry and become a huge obstacle for the modernization of traditional medicine industry. In 2015, Chinese scientist Tu Youyou wins the Nobel Prize in Medicine for her outstanding research on the Chinese herbal medicine, Artisimian, not only highlighting the tremendous value of traditional herbal medicines, but also providing great enlightenment for the modernization of a traditional medicine. World Animal Protection believe there is no future for the wildlife in traditional medicine. Plant and human alternatives are the only solution. 
with credible research on plant alternatives to wildlife traditional medicines. World Animal Protection is building strategic partnerships with multiple stakeholders, such as pharmaceutical companies, TM communities, and policymakers from relevant governments towards wildlife-free traditional medicine. Encouragingly, some progress has been made since the campaign was launched in 2019. We have moved four Chinese pharmaceutical companies to the support wildlife-friendly medicine initiative. They all committed not to produce and sell medicines and healthcare products containing wildlife ingredients and to promote herbal alternatives. In 2020, more than 300 TM doctors promised to stop prescribing wildlife drugs and educate consumers and patients to support herbal alternatives. An online database was launched about the traditional Chinese medicine alternatives to wild animal preparations in September 2020. The database included 15 common wild animal parts in traditional medicine and lists 189 plant-based remedies. We'd like the database to be a useful tool for TCM practitioners, medical researchers, and the public who are looking for substitutes of TCM remedies concerning wild animal parts. Internationally, in collaboration with Oxford University, we published a research on demand detection interventions with consumers of wildlife TM products. It suggests that herbal substitutes is more likely to gain consumer support than just calling for reduced consumption on social media. Another study conducted by our local partner, Blood Lions, last year also indicate that lion farms in South Africa pose a major health risk to captive lions and the public. Data shows that more than 8,000 lions are bred and kept in commercial farms for tourism, hunting, and the bone trade in South Africa. We also see positive changes from the policy. All pangolins were listed to CITES Appendix 1 in 2018, which means international trade of pangolins are not allowed anymore in China. Pangolins are also moved to national class one species from the class two in 2020. And the latest Chinese pharmacopoeia also removed the pangolin scales from its list. In a circular issued by the Chinese government late last year, that medicine containing the endangered wild animal parts will be no longer covered by the national medical insurance in future. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Yevonson, um, and, and for doing all the, all the wonderful work that you're doing in China. Um, I would now like to invite our second speaker, uh, who is Manisha. Uh, Manisha brings in a cumulative of 21 years of experience, uh, with 17 years in the corporate sector, followed by another two and a half years of dabbling in entrepreneurship and freelance writing. She currently works as a senior program manager with FIAPO for the plant-based living campaign. Initially starting with rescue, rehab, and fostering in an individual capacity, she's been volunteering for animal rights since the last 17 years. A compassion enthusiast, her current role at FIAPO allows her to contribute to multiple causes dear to her. Sustainable living, the right to respect and dignity for all species, and vegan advocacy. Today, she touches upon the role of the plant-based movement as a unifying force, bringing together multiple narratives on ethics, sustainability, public health and food security, as well as animal uh, advocacy. So over to you, Manisha. Hello, everybody. I'm Manisha Singh, and I work with FIAPO as the senior program manager for our plant-based living campaigns. Very happy to be here today to discuss the role of the plant-based movement. Um, however, before I start, I must confess that when this topic was initially shared with me, I was uh, really in a quandary, I was in a dilemma, because uh, there are so many multiple agendas and issues surrounding animal agriculture, and therefore the role of the plant-based movement, 
um, you know, in terms of, say, for example, climate change or deforestation or biodiversity loss. Um, there are multiple lifestyle uh, diseases that we know are caused um, due to consumption of animal products, such as hypertension, obesity, even cancer, um, diabetes. And then there are the horrors of intense factory farming conditions, needless suffering and pain um, that is inflicted on billions of uh, farm animals that are bred purely and procreated purely to satisfy cravings for meat and dairy that humans as a species have. So, um, you know, there is also at the same time an increased realization that uh, plant-based diets are in fact perfectly adequate for satisfying our nutritional needs. And thanks to documentaries such as Cowspiracy and What the Hell, we have these points coming up into the public domain. I must also mention here that when I was thinking of the plant-based movement, I was also thinking about the key food trends, you know, that are, um, that have been prevalent in uh, plant-based uh, in the plant-based sector over the last five years. In fact, key food trends across uh, the food industry um, have shown an exciting um, have shown an in interest and excitement about these or about alternative proteins and uh, you know flexitarian diets. And these do happen to be very exciting spaces um, to be in because of rising consumer demands. Um, and, um, you know, uh, with uh, food companies such as Dyson, Purdue, Unilever, McDonald's, all investing in um, vegan products, jumping onto the vegan bandwagon, it is clear that, uh, you know, the plant-based market is here to stay. And as you can see from the graphs displayed on the screen, they are growing exponentially. The one thought though, as I was thinking about all this, um, is that for me, you know, the biggest role that the plant-based movement plays today, and this is because of the unrelenting efforts of activists, researchers, thought leaders, forward-thinking organizations, entrepreneurs, the biggest role that the plant-based movement is playing today is to serve as an integrating, unifying platform for the multiple narratives that civil society is currently interested in building on ethics, on sustainability, public health, and food security across the globe. We also need to place our discussion today in the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. As animal activists, we have often despaired of animal rights and welfare taking a backseat amongst other social justice movements. And we've wondered how to bring these issues into the mainstream. It's as if uh, nature decided to take matters into its own hands in 2020 and whether you know it was a developed, developing or underdeveloped nation, everyone was uniformly struck by COVID-19 pandemic. And then suddenly the concept of One Health became uh, you know, so much more relevant, although it has, been, it has existed since decades. There was a need to acknowledge our interconnectedness um, across multiple scientific disciplines, human and animal health, of course. And it became an imperative, although in the most jarring and not so nice ways due to the onset of the pandemic. Now with the origin of the virus being linked to open slaughter and sale of animals in wet markets, um, you know, the, our thought leaders and uh, you know, governments across the world were forced to take notice of what experts had been pointing out all along that we have to reevaluate our relationship with nature, even for the survival of our own human species. In addition, the medical community had to acknowledge the link between healthy plant-based diets and the chances of beating the COVID virus through better immunity. And uh, the WHO's recommendations on strengthening immunity through a balanced diet only bolstered these realizations. So we can see how the pandemic provided an unprecedented lift to the momentum that the plant-based movement had gained over the last decade, which was also reflected in the rising demand of uh, rising consumer demand, continued development of plant-based alternatives and investment, increasing investment in plant-based businesses across the world today. So far, as we can activists, we have been, you know, always thinking about uh, how, you know, about speciesism and how it is irrational and counterproductive to think of humans as being the, you know, like the center of the universe as being the most important 
species of the planet. And uh, we laid out ethical and moral arguments about how non-human non animals should also live their lives with dignity and freedom and that they have equal rights and uh, to human beings and intrinsic value. The pandemic proved that even if one did not prescribe to this ideology, humans would have to necessarily change their lifestyle uh, in order to uh, you know, ensure the survival of the human species. And as a result of this, what this has done is that it, it has done, you know, it, it, has, um, re, it has raised this unprecedented, um, uh, you know, uh, development in the animal rights and welfare space, where animal rights and welfare have suddenly been pushed into the mainstream narrative. We all know, of course, that this is just the beginning. There is a long road ahead, you know, deeply entrenched habits uh, formed by several years of marketing of animal products to us, short-term uh, political agendas, narrow economic considerations are still barriers for the plant-based uh, movement. However, what we have on our side is this integrative uh, role that the plant-based movement plays, expanding the scope of um, you know, the movement beyond the narrative of only animal issues and agendas and bringing together rational thinking, conscious citizens of the world uh, who want to make the world a better place. So whether you love animals or not, whether you are anti-speciesist or not, if you want to survive and ensure the survival of future generations of both human and non-human animals, then you have to embrace the plant-based movement in whatever capacity you can. And I'm proposing that at the very least, this must start with everyone, you know, who says that they love animals and have an affinity for them. So, because unlike in the past, where um, one had to invest significant time, energy, money in order to um, engage in the animal movement through rescue rehab efforts or supporting shelters, the plant-based movement requires minimal investment. It is very easy to follow. All one has to do is change what one, what one puts on their plates. So even if you find yourself unable to engage directly with animals, you could just very easily go plant-based if you say you like animals. Most traditional local cuisines in Asia offer several varieties of plant-based dishes that we've been consuming since hundreds of years now. Also, we know the excitement around plant-based alternatives in the West with uh, you know Beyond Meat and uh, the impossible burgers being symbolic of these. Asia has already, of course, already opened its doors to these exciting plant-based alternatives and coming up with very interesting options of uh, its own. So even if you don't do anything, you can just change your own eating habits and go plant-based. And the moment you do so, you know, you are actually already contributing massively to, the, to increasing the momentum of this movement. This is because one, you will save you know, as many animal lives as you don't consume. Second, you will automatically and sometimes unwittingly become a plant-based evangelist. This is because your friends, family, colleagues are bound to ask you why you're not consuming animal products. And as you talk about your reasons, you bring more awareness into uh, your own circles about this important topic. Also, as you go about your day-to-day -day life, um, choosing plant-based options on food menus and, uh, you know, in looking at ingredients on supermarket shelves, there will be further conversations sparked about your lifestyle choices. And in the end, you will feel so great that you will want to inform the whole world and make them join your path. The plant-based movement, in fact, offers several options if you want to do animal advocacy. You know, you could identify, if you identify yourself as an animal activist, then you can raise awareness, um, to outreach to individuals and uh, you know target general public, schools, colleges. You could speak at events. Um, you could use social media, write blogs, or in fact just create you know uh, films and documentaries. If you could, uh, you know, if you want, you can also join institutional campaigns that target corporates, quick service restaurants, you know, places um, where uh, of uh, you know public eating um, and talk about replacement of meat and dairy with plant-based options. You could work with government and policymakers for uh, introducing taxes on animal agriculture, removing subsidies and incentives for animal products, or, you know, just work for the legal protection of farmed animals. 
or you could also engage in facilitative activism, uh, which would mean that you are then an, either an entrepreneur or you are some way developing and marketing plant-based alternatives. So encouraging entrepreneurship in the sector uh, that, you know, and, and encouraging the plant-based movement in, in, in the end. So I would like to now acknowledge that I'm one of those who subscribe to the belief that behavior change is sustained and lasting only when based on ethics. So behavior change will most likely stick when we give up eating animals because we recognize their sentience, that they have equal right to life, freedom, and dignity. However, as animal activists, I also believe that we must use all tools at our disposal for impacting the tremendous amount of suffering faced by billions of farmed animals today. The plant-based movement offers a way to expand our influence and work on farmed animals and include a larger group of people that are concerned about sustainability, public health, and food security. It's a unique opportunity to not just save many more animal lives by embracing other arguments such as health, environment, reducitarianism, animal welfare for farmed animals included, so that even if we are not able to save animal lives immediately, we can at least reduce the quantum of their suffering. So I think that is the role of the plant-based movement, this integrative unifying platform across civil society and across um, you know, animal activists who subscribe to different ideologies. Thank you so much for listening to me and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to speak on this topic. Thank you so much, Manisha. That was indeed a very uh, interesting uh, presentation that I think opens up my mind to a lot of new perspectives. Um, so I think I have so many uh, ideas and questions, but I would first like to hear from our last speaker. Uh, we have with us Mian Osumi, who joins us as the international representative of the Beji Project Japan, uh, a leading Japanese vegan organization that primarily works with institutions and companies to introduce more vegan options. Veggie Project also does outreach and education work throughout the vegan community by building events, lectures, and local universities through Veggie Project chapters. Ultimately, they hope to create a Japan where it is easy and delicious to choose vegan. Um, today, uh, Nian Osumi will be addressing the need for prioritizing effectiveness and efficiency in the plant-based movement by shifting the focus from individual to institutional advocacy. Uh, over to you, Nian. Miyano Sumi, I'm representing Veggie Project Japan, and I'll be presenting on effective advocacy for farmed animals. So the topic of this talk was the role of the plant-based movement in animal rights. And farmed animals being included in animal rights is not always a given, so I would like to briefly touch upon that. So the suffering of farmed animals is one of the greatest moral emergencies of our time, the type of animal that the average person actually interacts with in the greatest quantity is not their pet or the occasional visit to the zoo, it is the three times a day when a person sits down to eat the dead bodies or secretions of non-human animals. And the suffering of farmed animals I think is one of those things that the human mind is not equipped to fully conceptualize. I recently learned that farmed animals make up 60% of the earth's entire mammal biomass and 70% of the earth's bird biomass. That is so many animals living and dying in misery, even omitting fish, which actually make up the bulk of animals exploited for food. The number of farmed animals is 100 to 1,000 times higher than estimates for the number of companion and lab animals, who have historically received the disproportionate amount of attention from the public and also within the animal rights movement. This is a collage of one of the most hilariously depressing phenomena I think to ever exist, which are barbecue fundraisers for animal shelters. So given this history, which is not really a history because it continues today, I wanted to establish that farmed animal suffering certainly deserves a place, if not the central place, in the animal rights movement. 
And I also bring up the scope of farmed animal suffering because I want to establish that what I'm about to say comes from a place of urgency, not moderation. So my topic today is the role of flexitarianism in farmed animal advocacy. I wanted to mention that I will be drawing a lot on the data of the Western animal rights movement because that's where I found a lot of readily available data and also because the Western model provides lessons, I think, in their failure to bring veganism into the mainstream for so many decades despite having a pretty robust movement from the 60s. So thus far, the farmed animal rights movement has been powered by passionate, often animal-loving people who wish to turn people into full vegans, who also go vegan for the right reasons. This style of advocacy was absolutely me when I first started my vegan advocacy, and I am vegan for the animals, and I expected other people to follow suit when I showed them the reality of animal agriculture. And this feeling is totally valid, and I think stems from our need to have our faith in humanity restored, because after you find out about the widespread systemic abuse of animals, and you see everyone around you participating in that abuse, your faith in humanity is obviously shaken to its core, and the only way to restore that, to heal ourselves from that secondary trauma, is to watch people go vegan for the animals. But while I think we want to think of veganism as an issue of lack of information, of ignorance, it really is largely an issue of willful ignorance, I think, and people don't just go vegan because you show them slaughterhouse footage, as I'm sure any vegan who's been vegan for long enough will know. And so one of the hardest lessons I had to learn was that my personal desire to see humanity live up to a certain moral standard of awareness, empathy, and compassion that, might I add, is pretty hard to meet under an oversaturated capitalist society where people are set up to be busy and tired. Our desire to see people live up to those standards of humanity is not as important as reducing the suffering of animals. So how do we reduce the suffering of farmed animals and why would these two things be in conflict? So this is the model for the adoption of technology, but it works well for social change as well. You can see on the far left here, we do need people that are strongly motivated to be activists and create change for animals, and those people are going to be the vegans. But thus far, the failure, I think, of the farmed animal rights movement has been to remember that movements require more than these core individuals. They require the social and economic capital backing of the widespread public here shown in the pink, green, and blue, and especially the space between the pink and the green is where a chasm occurs often where movements struggle, the space between early adopters and the tipping point that brings us into the mainstream. And right now, we're trying to create change like this, having everyone go vegan when the goal more realistically should be to shift people along this spectrum. And this is where the plant-based movement comes in. Looking at the market data here in the US, you can see that the overwhelming percentage of people buying vegan products are not vegan themselves. And in Japan, we often talk about how envious we are of the selection of vegan products in the West that are taking over fast food chains and grocery stores, but this success is not due to an increase in the number of vegans, which hasn't changed much in the US since the 90s. It's because of a rapid increase in flexitarians. But our movement still caters to the interests and emotional direction of vegans in everything we do, in our outreach material that is always to get people to go vegan, in the amount of time we devote in discussing issues like cross-contamination, and worrying about how ethically pure products are, when actually vegans are not a very important consumer base. And we not only center vegans, but we gatekeep out everyone else oftentimes. And rather than worry about holding ourselves to the highest moral standard possible, we should worry about getting more people to hold themselves to a better standard. And I also don't mean to just talk about consumerism here and center capitalism. I think another issue within veganism is how we're seen as synonymous with a certain consumerist lifestyle. And this is the depoliticization of a movement that is at its core very political that deals with the status of non-human animals in society. And I think the plant-based flexitarian movement has a lot to offer in social change as well, because this isn't just about how people's consumer habits change incrementally, so do their social identities and beliefs. 
flexitarianism is key to the social normalization of veganism because right now it's vegans versus everyone else. We need a middle ground to identify our allies. And it's also a good stepping stone, I think. The way our identities change is not overnight. And there's actually a term, uh, vegan amnesia, that names how vegans often forget their own psychological journey to veganism. We might feel like, I saw a documentary and I went vegan the next day, but in reality, worldviews do not change overnight. And research specifically about veganism shows that when people make one step towards veganism, they are likelier to later take a further step. So, for example, flexitarians are more likely to go vegetarian than meat eaters, and vegetarians are more likely to go vegan than flexitarians. And it's not just about where you are on the vegan spectrum, it's also about why you are where you are. Most of us here, I assume, care deeply about animals, and we want to be reassured that other people care about animals as a natural extension of wanting to be reassured that people are good. But the fact of the matter is, and this is based on data in the West, but also my anecdotal experience talking to people about veganism in Japan, taste and convenience are paramount to people. And to make a dietary change, health is often the primary motivating factor. And it's heartening to see the environmental argument gain ground, but I suspect that the animal rights argument is the kind of worldview shift that will naturally follow after we stop exploiting animals, not as a cause, a primary cause to stop exploiting them, unfortunately. And so I think ultimately we have to understand that the reasons that attracted the original 2% are not necessarily, and in fact are highly unlikely, to be the reasons that attract these other demographics of people. And so that next step for the farmed animal movement might not be in veganism, but in centering flexitarianism. There is a quote in vegan psychologist Melanie Joy's book, Powerarchy, that I really love, and it's something like, we must interact with people as they are, not as we wish they were. And we can talk all day long about how people should be. People should be open-minded, more critically thinking, more compassionate. They should prioritize the life of an animal over the ephemeral pleasure of taste. There's really no end to the way I wish humanity lived up more to my image of people that I had as a child and I'm sure many other people had, but we grow up and we realize people are complicated and they have their reasons for being complicated and as activists, we really have no choice but to meet people where they are. And of course, there are lost causes, but most people, when it comes at little to no personal cost to them, will make the right choice. And so we must reduce that personal cost and make it easier for them to make that choice. And so in releasing our expectations of people, instead we can work to make it easier for people to make vegan choices. And also, instead of focusing on how many people go vegan, to see each individual choice, each person's small choice towards veganism, even if they are not themselves completely vegan, as a win for the animals. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Mian. I think that was such a fascinating presentation and certainly like uh, it helps us see how we should really kind of view uh, the situation we're in and then the position that we're in. Uh, so thank you to all the amazing speakers for like kind of highlighting different aspects of why the plant-based movement needs to grow and how it needs to grow. Um, and we do have a few questions for us and uh, I'm maybe just going to kind of uh, start reading them and see how they go, uh, and and they're kind of open to all. And if not, I will kind of mention who the question is for. Uh, so the first question that we have um, is that plant-based products and companies are on the rise. How do you think activism needs to combine with such companies to spread awareness about veganism? Um, so anyone can take that question. Hey, Shweta, I think, um, you know, I will take that question because we do have some experience of doing this in the past in FIAPO. Um, so what we normally, you know, what we have done in the past is, say, for example, when we knew that there was a plant-based product that was coming up, uh, we would hold, um, you know, uh, plant-based demos. Um, so activists can actually, so we, as we, um, we have a big grassroots network of activists uh, across India. And uh, we would coordinate with these activists to hold events where they would do demos of these plant-based products in popular places such as malls, at fests, at 
various uh, events, etc. So that is one way. Um, the second way is that recently during the pandemic, we have also been promoting uh, these stories on our social media platform, wherever we find that a promising local plant based company is emerging. Uh, we give them a shout out and we ensure that, you know, uh, people are therefore aware that there are these different options available in different places across India. So these are some of the, you know, some of the measures. However, overall, I think even as we work on increasing education and awareness of plant-based products and how, um, you know, they tie into health, environment, ethics issues, we are already making a huge difference by building a consumer base for such products in future. So the more activism we do, the more awareness and education we do, we help contribute to raising that consumer demand. Something that we've touched upon in the previous session as well. I think that was a fantastic session. I was listening in and, um, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things that we do when we, uh, when we do uh, this kind of activism. Also to share that uh, in 2019, we did a focus group discussion uh, with plant-based businesses to find out what would be their uh, expectations from an organization like FIAPO. And one of the biggest things that emerged was this, that can you give a shout out? Can you start education and awareness sessions? Can you do more activism so that we are increasing the consumer base for our products? So yeah. Thanks, Manisha. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. And I think we sometimes forget that every time we speak, and especially in this world, we're all ambassadors. And, you know, we are like kind of planting seeds in people's hearts and minds every time we kind of promote something or say, you know, offer an opinion. So I think those voices uh, from individual to institution can really help um, spread, like, you know, increase demand and spread veganism. Um, so thank you for that answer. Um, we now have a question for Mian, and it's a it's, it's a message and a question, so I'm going to read the whole thing out. Um, Craig says, I love your talk, and I agree with a similar point made by Jian Di that getting one million people to go flexitarian or meatless uh, or start meatless Mondays is actually more helpful to animals than to get 1,000 people to go vegan. However, how do you think this weighs up against the fact that veganism is a commitment versus flexitarianism? Uh, which flexies may easily habitually stray away from, you know, so when you're vegan, you're kind of committed, whereas flexitarianism is I could eat like a Beyond Meat burger today, but tomorrow if I don't get it, I can, you know, switch away from it. So, so over to you, Mian. Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I think with veganism, the problem is that it is quite difficult. I mean, we don't think it's difficult because it's become a habit for us, but a lot of people, I think the majority of people actually stop being vegan as well. So being vegan isn't quite a 100% commitment as well. And a lot of people stop, drop off from being vegan and vegetarian. And I know in the US, it's around five to 8% that are vegan and vegetarian. And it's like 15% that are ex-vegan and ex-vegetarian. And we don't really have, we see those people as enemies almost because they've left the movement. But I think what my, what I want to relay the most is yeah, we need to have this middle ground where we can identify allyship with people that don't have the discipline, I suppose, to put it bluntly, um, to go vegan. But uh, in a social movement, you need as many people on your side. And uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Mian. Yeah, I think I think it's important to remember that veganism itself has a very high recidivism rate, like something over 80% from what I remember. Um, so maybe we want more habits that can stick um, in the long run and then have industry-wide changes. So, so I agree with you over there. Um, I think there's another question for uh, Dr. Yevonson. Uh, Dr. Yevon, I think uh, you, you spoke a lot about like, uh, you know, uh, moving away from um, uh, not using wildlife in traditional medicine. Um, and given that it seems like a fairly recent campaign, it started out in 2019, um, there seem to be a lot of successes that, 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 that have already been underway, which is amazing. So what do you think has been the most successful strategy um, that you think could be replicated in other parts of the world when, they're, when we're talking about such a campaign? Or do you think China is also uniquely placed um, within this conversation of wildlife and traditional medicine? Okay, thank you. Um... Yes, that's a very new campaign. We launched it two years ago. And uh, many things we are still, you know, um, uh, trying to test our strategies. Uh, but basically, uh, I believe that the trend is quite positive uh, in terms of the policy. You know, the Chinese government is, is, is uh, pro pro 
small tide about a, a eco civilization, which wildlife is a key part of this uh, new idea. And many policies has been reversed uh, to give more protection for wild animals. In terms of wild animal in the traditional medicine, actually majority endangered species already removed from the, uh, the, the list of the pharmacopoeia. But uh, we still see some, uh, you know, especially interest group, they are promote uh, to using wildlife because that's, they can make money. So, and also many consumers, uh, they are quite uh, misled by the uh, exaggerate um, advertisement uh, for those products. So the, it's key to raise the awareness of the public about the issue behind. And at the same time, we need to work with the key stakeholders like the TCM doctors and the, the, the TCM industry uh, to change uh, to a fully you know, plant-based uh, TCM industry in the future. That's benefit for the people, for the animal, for the environment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Evan. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think so it's a mix of kind of building public opinion and then working with the, uh, with the regulatory authorities. Sorry, just one second. Um, and working with the regulatory authorities to kind of, you know, come up with the best solutions from, from what I can uh, tell. So I, I, that, that I can see that being like a good strategy. Um, I think the next question is both for Mian and Manisha, because it's like a mix of, of, of a few different things. Um, and, and the question really is that how important is it to create an environment of change when we're thinking about, uh, you know, getting people to change? So I think uh, the question really comes from the sense of uh, we, we, we do, uh, within, whether we're talking about flexitarianism or we're talking about veganism, we're almost still very much in the realm of um, individuals kind of making the change, you know, and, and maybe not stressing so much on how can we create an environment, because ultimately the decisions we're making today are a product of, uh, I think like Manisha touched upon, you know, advertising and like, you know, kind of circumstantially what we see every day, what we hear every day, and, you know, the, the decisions are almost, um, uh, you know, ha happening at a more subconscious level. So how, how important do you think it is to create an environment that kind of allows flexitarianism, that allows veganism, and how much emphasis do you think we should put on kind of individual change versus working with industry to actually change, and then, you know, change will follow. So it'll be great to hear from both of you uh, on that. Okay, I can go first, but um, I think, yeah, that's a really great point. And we often talk about sort of the physical environment and physical access, but I think one thing that has been sort of understudied is the social environment as well. And I think right now we live in a social environment that's really not conducive to veganism and choosing vegan options or being vegan. You often feel socially ostracized. I think so many vegans say this, like going vegan, finding vegan food wasn't the hardest part. It's like dealing with non-vegans and um, getting laughed at at the dinner table. And I, I think the solution for that is for vegans to honestly be two things, which sound a little opposite, but let me explain. Like, I think one thing is being less apologetic. Like I am vegan and I'm vegan for the animals. And, um, and like, there's a lot of silent vegans out there that just don't even talk about they, cause they're scared of being pushy. And it's like, people will label you pushy no matter what at some point. So, um, you have to be, you can't be silent, but I think on the other hand is being out and proud, but, um, being, uh, pr uh presenting, a type of veganism that feels emotionally and socially accessible to people. So not like you have to go vegan tomorrow, but yeah, like I said, like um, I think steps in between and every single choice that you make, like today for dinner, I'm having a V, I'm choosing a vegan option that is reducing that we celebrate those choices rather than uh, people's identities as a whole. Um, so yeah, I think those two actions would lead to a better social environment. Thanks, Mian. Um, Manisha? Yeah, so uh, I totally agree with me. And I think the social environment, you know, changing the social environment is really critical. And how we who are uh, kind of a little ahead on that journey behave and interact with people around us really, really then either helps or, you know, makes it difficult. 
uh, to do that. I think there's also a very critical role that institutions play, and uh, that is what I think um, we should increasingly focus on. So while our consumer activism and interventions towards individuals have already taken up in a big way, for example, in India, and I also see this across the world, there is a need to also do activism towards, like you said, the industry or towards government, towards policymakers. So for example, we've been working with the Food Safety and Standards Authority in India to tell them to give more, you know, to persuade them to give more plant-based messaging. And during the pandemic, they did come out with that. We have regular interactions with them. Uh, we were invited um, in this meeting where they are considering uh, banning the use of milk and milk-like products uh, for any dairy alternatives. Um, so it's about, you know, kind of discussing with them, putting our views forth. Um, and those kind of interventions, along with working with some of the other institutional um, players in, in, uh, in shaping this environment, for example, the UN Food Systems Summit that we you know, spoke about earlier, you know, all those larger international organizations, looking at where the money comes from, looking at financial institutions internationally, and how can we launch pressure campaigns on them to ensure that uh, they are the ones who then drive this reform. Because if you look at a country like India, the reason why we had the white revolution, the so-called white revolution where dairy was, you know, really became a big product in India. And today we are the largest consumer and uh, producer of dairy in the world. The reason for that is because of the encouragement to uh, dairy cooperatives in India. And you know, that is where a lot of marginalized communities, rural communities uh, came together. And this, this sector is something that the government sees as being a win-win for everyone. Whereas it's not, they're not looking at the long-term impact of that. So how do we change government orientation towards these interventions? How do we build um, interventions where uh, you know, all sectors um, are seen as being equally, all, all uh, players, all, um, say for example, the farmer community, how do we protect the interests of the farmer community while we go ahead with these? Um, so there are a lot of political, economic, um, you know, implications of these kind of changes, but we have to make a start and we have done that, but I think that needs to gain more momentum now uh, in order to make significant change. While at the same time, I also think that individual activism, consumer activism continues to be very important. So I wouldn't say this is more important than that. It is about really checking the context in which one is and then putting more resources behind one or the other strategy after you know making a considered decision about how much resources we have as an organization to go behind a particular strategy what is going to have the larger long-term impact would a short-term impact make more sense now compared to a long-term intervention it's a complex world um, but what is really um, encouraging for me is that across the world we're looking at institutional interventions as uh, being you know really important in this movement Yes, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with you, Manisha. I think there's a really important case to be made for like why things are cheap today, uh, because there are, you know, they're pushed by subsidies. And I think the need for uh, everyone from farmers, you know, farmers' rights organizations to vegan grassroots organization to interact in spaces like the UN Food System Summit or, or, or you know, COP26 now, I think they're really important. And I think they can be game changing for how we operate alongside, of course, uh, policy and behavior change work that, that we do anyway. Um, I have one question I think that kind of holds true for everyone, um, which is that I think we're in a unique kind of space right now. Uh, and I think COVID-19 has given us like a lot of, uh, you know, shared kind of, uh, it ha has created like a shared sense of where we, you know, of, of loss uh, and a shared sense of how we need to build back better from, from where we are. Um, and how do you think uh, us as like organizations in this space uh, can can use this this moment, you know, because it is a, almost like a once in a lifetime uh, moment while being very cognizant of um, of the ongoing suffering of people, because we don't want to sound at any point of time like, you know, look what happened. You know, we, we've been saying this for ages and now look what, you know, so we don't want to sound like that yet at the same time, this is a very big wake up call. So uh, how, how do you think we can use this moment to really kind of make a change and make, make governments and institutions and individuals, everyone realize the, the kind of velocity and force of this uh, without, without being insensitive uh, to it? And it's, it's open for everyone.
Um, Dr. Je um, Manisha, go ahead. All right. Yeah. Dr. Evan, please go ahead. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, as you said, I think that's um, one reflection from this uh, pandemic, I think, is uh, the human the mankind should be reflect, uh, you know, the relationship, uh, the humans and the natural and the animals. And we, maybe the current uh, uh, systems, uh, uh, we, we, we believe that uh, we take them as granted has some problem. We need to consider uh, whether we have a better system, uh, we can achieve the real sustainable development. For example, um, can current uh, the, 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 the Earth's environment can sustain so many, you know, the livestock or uh, the way we explore the wildlife resources. I think we need to build a new relationship with the natural, with the animals. And in that way, uh, we can really achieve a better world uh, in the future. Thank you, Dr. Yevon. Uh, Mian, do you want to go next? Yeah, I just had a quick comment, which I think the vegan movement struggles in various aspects about coming across as insensitive because our movement does intersect with so many issues and it's hard when we talk about other issues that they immediately think like, oh, well, they're just bringing it up. They're, they're sort of weaponizing <laughs> this issue. And it's like, I mean, it's just, it's the truth. But I think the way to um, not be perceived as that, the best way is to constantly be fighting for those other marginalized groups. So obviously COVID has impacted certain people over others, predominantly women and communities of color and slaughterhouse workers. And I think it's really important to speak out for those groups outside of the vegan context too. Um, so that people know you really care about those groups. You're not just talking about it when it has to do with animals. That's such a wonderful answer. Uh, Manisha. I, I agree with both uh, Dr. Evan and Mian. Um, I think, yes, um, you know, it's important to be sensitive. And the way really to get to that point of sensitivity is to have this integrative dialogue. And that's what I was trying to say in my presentation, that we need to involve more actors. We need to, there are people who are concerned about the environment. There are people who are concerned about sustainability. Can we as, you know, build bridges with those movements? Can we uh, include them? Can we make this a more inclusive space? And I think the plant-based movement allows one to do that. So I'm not necessarily talking about taking a vegan line. I'm talking about the plant-based movement in general, where we encourage plant-based alternatives, where we talk about the advantages of plant-based diets, where we encourage anyone and everyone to join into and, you know, like change their dietary patterns. Um, and at whatever point they are in, you know, some people, so for example, in India, which is supposed to be largely a non-vegetarian country, we know that only 30% are pure vegetarians. 70% of them have non-vegetarian uh, you know, options in their diet. And uh, of those 30%, there are also a large, uh, you know, a large portion of that who consume dairy. So there's a long way to go. And any steps that we can take in that direction by encouraging the plant-based industry, I think using marketing, using public policy, like you said, you know, using uh, you know, activism in the international space, la launching pressure campaigns on institutions, all of these together can be done in a way that shows that we are with you. You know, it's not like a movement that's saying you're wrong. It's, it's a movement that's saying, you know, here's a solution. Here's, uh, we are facing this problem and we are in this together. Let's, let's look at, let's not ignore what science and research has lately pointed out through many different articles. These are peer reviewed articles. Uh, you can't deny the facts. So here are the facts. It has to be data-based. It has to be fact-based. When we do that, then I think we move away from that whole point about, you know, the sensitivity around it because it's not just feelings and we're not blaming anybody. We're just laying bare um, reality as it exists today. So yeah, I would say back it up with data, back it up with science. And you know that's one way to uh, really do it without uh, then hurting people's sentiments or um, then moving them away from one's position. Thanks, Manisha. Yeah, I think the intersectional approach uh, is certainly the way to go. Um, I have like one last, um, so do we have time for one last question, Sarah? Or, okay. So I'm just, uh, Mian, this is for you and we're gonna very quickly try and answer it so that we can close this. 
Um, Susie asks, how many percentages of flexitarians are there in the world right now? Is flexitarianism as good as vegetarianism? As you know, some might not really change their diet, although they deeply do care about animals. So any quick reflections on that? Yeah, so um, I, flexitarianism, the percentage is really hard to tell because it's such a loose definition. It can be like, I choose a vegan whenever I can, which is essentially veganism as we know, but most people don't know that. Um, or it can be like, I try to do meat-free Mondays. So I don't know the exact percentage, but I know it's, it's usually like double or triple the population of the vegans in that population size. And um, in answer to the second part of the question, flexitarianism is not as good as vegetarianism. Vegetarianism is not as good as veganism because you're saving more animals as you eat them less. Um, but I think we have to, I think it's like you save around 200 animals when you go vegan in a year. That's the statistic that I hear a lot. And we can't lose sight of how those 200, th those are all individuals. And so every single le animal less that a person is consuming is an animal saved. And I think what's really hard with this with vegans is like we don't want to be praising people honestly like even veganism is just not harming animals you're doing the bare minimum so it feels weird to even praise someone for doing meat-free mondays but it's really not about praising them at least internally like maybe you have to do that externally to keep them going but um and it's not seeing that as morally okay it's not changing our moral baseline it's about what sort of communication is effective so yeah it sounds almost calculating but um I really think this is the way that we can make our movement most emotionally accessible and, and mentally accessible which our movement really struggles with because people just hear vegan and they just shut down and so we want to get those people to not shut down I think that's really important yeah well uh, I think that this has been like a really interesting session I thank you so much uh, everyone for your questions thank you to all the speakers for coming up with uh, such thought-provoking answers um, and it was a pleasure to moderate this and I'm gonna hand it back over to Sarah now thank you Thank you so much, uh, Shweta. That uh, thank you so much, Shweta. That was absolutely wonderful, and I think it was superbly moderated. And we had such great interactions between uh, Mian and Manisha and Dr. Evan. And uh, I think some very important points uh, that came out there was, you know. Uh, Flexi, being flexi could be a great option to start with. Uh, discipline, behavioral change, balance. These were such important words that came out from that entire interaction and they are so vital for uh, moving this movement forward, which is again, very vital for us and for our non-human, uh, non-human, uh, um, animals that are with us coexisting on the earth. So I think uh, it was fantastic. And I think our audience simply loved it. They sent in so many uh, great questions that were, as Shweta said, extremely thought uh, provoking. And uh, um, once again, uh, thank you for your time, for your effort, for giving in um, these fantastic inputs and these great presentations. I hope you will stay for the further sessions in case you have the time. But in case not, uh, do stay safe and do stay healthy. 